Uh, evening, is there anyone speaking? No, not yet. Uh, we are waiting five past. Okay. Uh, my clock says it's five past six. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, webinar uh, hosted by the South African uh, Health Products Regulatory Authority in collaboration with the South African Pharmacy Council. Uh, the webinar is hosted under the auspices of the hashtag MedSafetyWeek uh, global campaign. And the theme for this year is your report matters. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, to introduce the topic, uh, I would like to indicate that the uh, South African Health Products Regulatory Authority is commemorating the hashtag MedSafetyWeek uh, social media campaign in collaboration with the South African Pharmacy Council by hosting, hosting this webinar focused on the importance of reporting adverse drug reactions. The hashtag MedSafetyWeek is an international social media campaign organized annually by the Uppsala Monitoring Center to, mo to raise awareness of adverse drug events and national reporting systems. This year will be the eighth annual hashtag MedSafetyWeek social media campaign, and it will take place from today until the 12th November this year. This year's campaign will focus on who can report these adverse drug reactions. This includes patients, caregivers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and pharmacy assistants. All of these roles uh, or all of these persons have a key role to play in the cycle of medicine safety. Different perspectives that come from these groups must be explored as, in, as information they provide in adverse events reports have a positive impact towards medicines and patient safety. It must be noted that SAPRA is mandated by law to oversee the safety quality, efficacy, and performance of all health products it regulates. It therefore ensures that all adverse events are investigated, monitored, analyzed, and acted upon. SAPRA shares all the adverse events reports with the WHO VG base, which is a global database for all adverse um, events submitted by member states. This includes South Africa. Reporting of adverse events to SAPRA assists in the identification of new side effects and gain more information or helps us gain more information about novel side effects and promote or ensures public safety. Ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you in the health uh, environment, you would know that the Regulation 40 of the Medicines Act requires of all healthcare practitioners to monitor adverse events and report such to SAPRA. And those of you who are in the pharmacy environment, especially those regulated by the South African Pharmacy Council, you would know that this is a further requirement in terms of the good pharmacy practice standards. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar will focus on increasing awareness of the integral role that every pharmacovigilance stakeholder, such as yourselves, plays in ensuring patient safety in the country. It will also focus on the importance of reporting the side effects that are associated with medicines. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the webinar. Uh, I'll be handing over to Mevu Siwa Musani to continue um, in, in, with a presentation on the importance of reporting adverse drug reactions. Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Busisiwam Sani, and I am a pharmacist by profession, and I work in the pharmacovigilance unit. Uh, I'll be showing my presentation just now, and uh, I'll switch off my camera. Okay, um, I'll be talking about the importance of reporting adverse events. And before we begin with that, uh, let's understand what is pharmacovigilance. And we'll get to the importance of reporting and who reports. So uh, when did pharmacovigilance start? We know, most of you know about the thalidomide uh, tragedy that occurred in the 1960s, where thalidomide was given off-label to pregnant women for nausea or morning sickness but it was not registered for that. It was registered for uh, as a sedative. Uh, but then this led to uh, babies born to these mothers with um, shortened limbs, a condition called phocomelia. And after that, there was a doctor by Dr. McBride who identified 13 reports of such um, birth defects in 1961. So this then led to um, establishment of the WHO program for international drug monitoring as mandated by World Health Assembly. And uh, this program ensures that evidence about harm to patients is collected as many from as many sources as possible because um, the program has uh, members from many countries so this would enable individual countries to be alerted to pet, uh, patterns of harm that were emerging across the world and which might not be evident from the local data alone. So the response to this tragedy then led to um, these three pillars of medicine safety. Uh, that the product registered has to be of good quality, it has to be efficacious, and most importantly, has to be safe to the patients using it and for the public at large as well. So, I, so I, as I said, that we should also understand what pharmacovigilance is, we understand the origin, so now let's look at what pharmacovigilance is. As WHO defines it, pharmacovigilance is the science and activities relating to the detection, the assessment and understanding and prevention of suspected adverse effects or any other drug-related problems. By detection, what do we mean? This includes identification of an adverse event and after which, after the identification, then uh, the healthcare professional or the patient reports to SAPRA. And once we receive these reports, when we come to assessment, 
we then investigate the severity of the event, the extent of the event and its preventability, and mostly uh, the impact it has towards the South African public. And then once we have assessed the event reported, then we have more knowledge about it and be able to share the knowledge with the colleagues. That's where understanding comes in. And where prevention, uh, as a medicine regulator, SAPRA, would be able to make regulatory decisions after the investigation and understanding, which will improve a uh, rational use of medicines and also improve health systems in the country. So the regulatory um, decisions that we make, uh, for example, are the dear healthcare professional letters that are, I assume um, healthcare professionals do receive, and then the maid safety alerts as well that we uh, publish on the website. The PIPIL amendments, which is the professional information and package um, uh, patient insert leaflet amendments. Once a safety concern has been identified and there's a need for PIPIL amendments, we communicate with the applicant and they then would uh, do the PIPIL PIL amendments for healthcare professionals and the patients to know about the safety concern. Now we come to the next objective of the importance of reporting. Uh, we know that before a medicine is registered, it goes through um, rigorous testing of safety and efficacy through clinical trials. However, the clinical trials process involves studying this product in a relatively small number of selected individuals and for a short period of time. And certain side effects may only emerge once these products have been used by um, the whole population and including uh, those that have uh, other conditions or are taking other medicines as well. And this may, uh, this side effect or adverse events may be identified after a long period. So that's why it is important to report because you may assume that uh, the side effects are listed in the professional information, but those are only limited to clinical trials studies. So post-marketing, that's when we would learn more about the medicine that is registered. So that's the importance of reporting. And again, um, we also uh, need the other importance of reporting is to, uh, for the benefit risk balance of the medicine. For a medicinal product to be authorized, the risk-benefit balance should be positive. So the benefit should outweigh the risk. And this is for the target population and the approved indication. Therefore, not all risk, as I said, of harm are identified at the time of marketing, hence the importance of reporting. Continuous safety monitoring is important for all products to identify and respond to risks of adverse drug reactions. So um, the medicine itself, we look at the, we monitor safety from before it was registered to post marketing through its whole, cycle, a whole life cycle. So um, 
that shows again the importance of a uh, reporting adverse events. And moving forward to who can report and how to report. So who can report? It's basically everyone can report. Healthcare professionals can report. Patients as well can report. Uh, their caregivers can report. Basically, everyone can report. And where do they report and how do they report? What are the tools that we use at SAPRA for the, for the stakeholders to report to us? We have a main safety app, which can be, sorry about that, which can be downloaded uh, to the, um, uh, to your phone, uh, um, smartphone, and you'd be able to report from the main safety app. And the app itself is, um, is the tool of choice for the regulatory authority because it also has um, news that you can read from it and also it's electronic it doesn't uh, take time as at times uh, healthcare professionals would say the paper-based reporting takes longer to to report to use the other electronic um, portal that we have on the website is the e-reporting, which is available on a SAPRA website. Uh, this also doesn't take long. Uh, on the SAPRA website, um, you'd be able to find a uh, where you could report. Uh, uh, in reporting it, you will be directed to the landing page of um, this uh, portal. It's just that this picture can show very well uh, where, where you can go. Uh, but uh, once you get to the website, you'll be able to be directed where to go for the e reporting. And another tool that we use is the paper base and it's also on the website and it has also been sent to provinces uh, to use. So um, once you have completed this paper base form, you then would have to send it to this email address and uh, you don't, you don't get an automated response as yet, but that we're still working on. The feedback that you would get after reporting is on um, the serious reports. We have to give a reporter's feedback on all the reports that we have received but uh, due to resource constraints, we're only concentrating on serious reports for now, but moving forward, we'll be able to provide feedback to uh, reporters, all the reporters. But again, we are also working on an automated response when you send an email or your paper-based form to the email, we are working on an automated response when uh, you then know that you, we have received your report and we are working on it. And again, uh, moving forward to the next slide, I touched a bit on what type of feedback you will get. This I've spoken about. And then the indiv individualized feedback we first have to do causality assessment on the case reported, as I said, serious cases. We discuss uh, within the unit as a peer review meeting where we would come with an outcome if 
then we don't come up with an outcome. We have um, a working group of experts that assist us in this regard, which would then have to um, escalate the reports to. And once uh, the causality assessment outcome has been reached, that's when we communicate to the individual uh, reporter. And another feedback that you do get, it's the new and updated medicine safety information, which can be accessed via the Made Safety app and also our website. And as I said, I spoke about the uh, amendments of professional information and patient information leaflets, where when we have identified safety concerns and there's a need to update uh, medicine uh, PI and PIL, we communicate to the applicant and then that is actioned. And the other thing is the newsletter, which we were publishing quarterly, but from now on it will be biannually. And it was um, called v uh, VG Guardian, but now the name has changed to MediGuardian. I hope uh, before the end of this month, it will be published on the website. Uh, the other feedback that you get is the safety related regulatory decisions on the website and also on the Maid Safety app. So we have um, monthly meetings where we discuss uh, safety concerns of public interest and uh, of high severity as well. And we discuss first. In, within the unit uh, in a peer review meeting. And if we have not reached a consensus, we then um, escalate to our advisory committee and they then uh, recommend to the authority, SAPRA, on which um, regulatory decisions can be made. We then communicate these regulatory decisions to applicable applicants. And after that, we then publish this document, which talks about the, the safety related regulatory decisions that have been made. This is published, as I said, on our SAPRA website. So, the, our reports. We send them to a global database. We use a, a system called VigiFlow, capture the reports that we receive, and then send them to a global database. And, but again, uh, the public does not have access to the global database. The global database is called VigiBase. The public doesn't have access to the global database. They have access to Vigi Access, which uh, gives an aggregated um, uh, reports or information about the reports that are on the VigiBase global database. So the reason for, for uh, sending this report to the global database, remember I spoke about uh, the program for um, monitoring um, safety concerns. Uh, so it's for other countries to also see what uh, South Africa, which reports are from South Africa. And also, we'd also be able to see what type of reports are reported worldwide. So that's the reason why we sent to the global database. And in certain instances, 
uh, for example, for product quality issues, signals of preventable reactions. SAPRA will conduct contact the reporter to provide or ask for additional information. So when one reports or healthcare professional reports and you don't have info, uh, enough information with whatever information that you have, you can report to us. But make sure that it is a valid report, meaning that it has to have a, an identifiable patient, an identifiable reporter, identifiable and um, contactable reporter, the reaction and the medicine or suspected medicine. So in a case that we need additional information from the reporter, we then have to contact you. That's the importance of a, our reporters to put their contact details there. So, and the other thing is, once you receive enough information about the report, you then would um, send the report as a follow-up report to the initial report that you have uh, sent to SAPRA. When you have the identifier or the unique number that is um, that it's from BG flow or allocated by BG flow, then you'd be able to indicate it on the follow-up report. The reason for that, if you have not indicated that this is a follow-up report, it will then be a duplicate report for us, and it wouldn't show um, a, the, the correct statistics for our reports. So uh, that is it for what kind of feedback we receive. And the most important thing is reporters should know that um, reporting an adverse drug reaction is blame free. So when you report, don't think that then uh, Sabra will be taking you to uh, to to the police or wherever for litigations that you have started the adverse drug reaction. So the reason for reporting is basically to make sure that patients are safe and they're using medicines that are safe. And as I said, that we also request that you um, send your contacts. Uh, we um we 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 are uh, what's the word we comply to the popia act or the poppy act so your information when is sent to vg base the information about the report when it's sent to vg base your details won't be sent. The details of the patient as well won't be sent to VGBase. So don't be afraid that we'll be sharing your details with uh, other countries. We, we are compliant with this act. And please don't be afraid. There are no litigations. We are not blaming you. We are just working together to make sure that patients are safe and they are using uh, medicines that are safe in the country. So thank you for that. Help us make medicine safer for everyone. Hashtag made safety week, hashtag report side effects, hashtag patient safety. Thank you, everyone. Are there questions or are we going to take questions after 
everyone has presented. Um, we'll see there's a Q&A uh, after the third speaker. Yes. Okay. Buddy Major, you want to come in? No, not at all. Uh, we can let the next speaker speak and then uh, we'll come in during the Q&A. Ethel, do you want to come in? Um, Mel, Hethel is not in. I suggest that maybe we move to uh, Elizabeth while uh, Hethel maybe gets, Second. yeah, tries to reconnect. Elizabeth, are you comfortable with going next? Elizabeth? Lucy, do you mind just calling Elizabeth, please? Elizabeth, I'm not sure if Elizabeth is speaking, but you're muted if you are speaking. Uh, evening. Good evening, Elizabeth. Um, we were struggling to get a hold of Hethel, so we we substituted your presentation with hers. So you're up now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm just going to present about the adverse events following immunization as I'm from the expanded program on immunization, as you can see on the, on the slide there. Let's move to the, the slide. Uh, the presentation is divided into two. We are looking at the side effects and we are looking at what the department is doing with regard to management of, of uh, adverse events following immunization. Can you just click again just to have that other? image yeah thank you so the definition of the adverse events following immunization is any untoward medical occurrence which follows immunization and which does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine and this definition is very important because although as a health worker you may be you, you may be 100 percent uh having uh that uh, i Having that thinking that this is not an adverse event, but as long as the patient or the client believes that the incident that he or she is having is through is, is through the administration of the vaccine, you must report it as such. So the adverse events may be any unfavorable or unintended sign, abnormal laboratory finding, symptoms or disease. When the patient presents any of these, you have to regard this as, as an adverse event following immunizations. 
And when you look at our National Regulatory Authority, which in our country is SAPRA, it ensures with regard the quality and the safety and effectiveness of vaccines and pharmaceutical products. Once the vaccine is introduced, uh, thoroughly that uh, there, there will be some, some some processes which are going to ensure that the, to ensure the safety of of the vaccines and when it's already introduced there will also be the monitoring of that vaccine the implementation of the vaccine and before being introduced the vaccines are assessed in the clinical trials some of these vaccines since they will be in the clinical trials, maybe not within the country, but some of them they will be within the country, especially when we are determining the age where their vaccine should be administered. We need the safety data for that age to say that these vaccines can be administered in a in, in a person of such a date, of such an age, sorry. Next. <laughs> so on top of the adverse events following immunization, this was the system, surveillance system that we have been monitoring for years as a program in expanded program on immunization. But the, with, the, with the rollout or the introduction of the COVID vaccines in 2021, there's, uh, there's another terminology called the adverse events of special interest. Trust. These are special interests that are please specify medically significant events and they have the potential to be cause, cause causally associated with a vaccine product. For an example, the anaphylaxis, even the current vaccines that we have beside the COVID, they can still cause anaphylaxis. And the active uh, vaccine surveillance is very important for the monitoring of the adverse events of special of special interest and incidence of ISC for COVID-19 vaccinated and unvaccinated COVID-19 vaccine product and it determined if there is a need for further specific study to confirm such an association as you all as, as you know that we started with a lot of vaccines with several vaccines which were all new in 2021 and that's where now this terminology or this surveillance system was introduced because those vaccines they were all new during the 2021 so they are currently is related to the COVID vaccination. But when we talk about the adverse events following immunization now, that terminology is related to all other vaccines, including the ones which are administered in the private sector. Because as a program in the department, we are also looking at vaccines, uh, the adverse events following immunization for vaccines which are outside the public sector, given in the private sector. As so I'm saying that we monitor all the vaccines. The next. So when you look at the side effects, all vaccines used in at the national uh, immunization program, they are safe and effective. I think uh, Busi has just presented on the process of SAPRA in making sure that whatever is done at SAPRA is, is, is for the public safety. So a uh, no vaccine, just like any other drug, there is no, no vaccines completely risk-free. So because we all, with all medication, we know that there are side effects, there are adverse events, uh, depending on the, on the person's response to that particular uh, drug. So the vaccines are uh, also similar to those drugs or the medication. So they are having some risk in certain in some uh, specific population. And the adverse events can range from minor side effects and much more severe reactions and can be a cause of public concerns about vaccine safety. Hence, as a department, we are very, very much a concern when the side effects or the vaccine or the adverse events is not managed well. Because once it's not managed well, then that will also bring a negative um, perceptions or, or misconceptions or misinformations or rumors about the vaccines that we are giving. 
and, and you have to ask yourself as a health care worker, what caused the reactions if, you, if any research, a reaction has been reported and was it related to the vaccine unrelated? And can you distinguish between the minor and the severe reactions so that you are able to manage that event? Because when it is a severe reactions, then you are required to do the investigations. In the provinces, we do have the outbreak investigation teams. And when there's an adverse event following immunization, when they go and investigate, the team should consist of everyone with the team, including the pharmacist should be part of the investigation team. The next one. So this is just to see the frequency of the minor events and also of the serious events. When you look at them, they are very common. So more than one in 10 vaccinated people are experiencing the minor events. When you look at the serious events, which One in 10,000 people experience events, and they are very rare. The very rare one, the rare one is one in 10 in 10,000, and the very rare one, they are less than one in 10,000 uh, people being vaccinated. And the, the, the minor one or the mild side effects, they are expected as they are also being done with each and every medication that you are taking, there are minor side effects. And with, with the vaccines also, they are, we are also expecting that. But the ones which are we are not expecting, but they are there, is those which are serious. And when you look at the serious ones, they can result in death and require hospitalizations, and they are life-threatening, and they result in persistence or significant disability. And also they can cause birth defects if the person is pregnant. And the minor events are local and they are part of the immune response and they are self-limiting and they resolve after a short period of time, such as maybe when after vaccination, especially when you talk about a child that you'll find that the person will have some high temperature or some pain on the injection side, those ones are minor events. The next slide. So this is just to show some of the vaccines that you are giving the public sector according to the EPI. Uh, the, 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 the frequency of them in happening, you can see that when we look at the measles which we are giving is uh, the local reaction happens in 10% of people who are being vaccinated. And the fever, which is the temperature, is 5 to 15%. And when you look at the, at the other one, the rash is 5% of people will get that. So this is just the slide to show each and every, um, I mean, or, or most of the vaccines that we are giving in PI at the public sector, the, the, the common uh, frequencies where they are appearing. The next slide. So now I'm going to talk about the death because we know that when we uh, uh, when we give the vaccine, remember that we are giving we are giving the vaccines to a healthy person or to a healthy child, and once there is an adverse event following immunization. And we need to manage that uh, uh, very well so that it doesn't uh, have negative impact on the vaccination program. As we know that uh, since the inceptions of vaccinations globally, it has saved millions and millions of lives. Uh, children from polio, dying from polio, from measles, from any vaccine preventable disease you can think of. So the death is also one of the serious events and the death in vaccinated people can occur when a person already incubating another disease at the time of vaccination because we are not screen you are not 
uh, doing the blood test or the test to check if the person is already having that disease because the person may be appearing healthy, then you vaccinate the person. Then after the person can die from the disease that he or he had already have. And that uh, the public will attribute that to the vaccine. We have seen with the COVID vaccination. And the person got sick shortly after being vaccinated before mounting an adequate immune response. These are what we call the coincidental uh, events because they were going to happen even if the person was, was not vaccinated, but now they happen just because the person has been vaccinated, then they will, people will actually, the public will attribute it to the, to, to the vaccine. And the non-vaccine related death can also happen coincidentally, as I said, and the main goal of the vaccination program is to prevent severe illnesses and prevent premature death of the elderly and people with chronic illnesses. And the elderly are, the elderly and the under five children are high risk uh, populations. And as you can know that with the elderly, they are also at higher risk of dying than the general populations. So they are also part of the high risk in dying. And the vaccines, they prevent uh, dying from a specific disease if vaccinated in time. And vaccines cannot prevent death from chronic diseases because they are not uh, preventing the chronic diseases. They are preventing the infection for the person to be uh, against that pathogen or against that, uh, that, that microbe which can attack the person. Next slide. What does EPI do to ensure that patient safety with regards to side effects uh, experience post-vaccination? Next slide. So this is the surveillance system cycle in South Africa. So, what is very important, the program there is, is for the detection or the reporting of the event or once it happened, it can be reported. The health worker can still report that by, by, by main fact of assessing the person. Like after vaccination, there's, with the clinical practices that the person should be observed 15 minutes before the person can leave, whether it's a child getting their routine immunization or what, the person must always be observed before he or she can leave the health facility. And if there's anything then uh, which is untoward to after vaccination, then it will be regarded as an, as an IFE and it should be reported as such. And there will be notification and, the, and reporting by the health worker. With the reporting we are using, we do have the forms, the case reporting forms, we do have the case investigation form. So all facilities will have the case reporting forms. And when the event is serious, then you gonna report, you're gonna, it's, it's, you are supposed to investigate it. So for reporting, we also have the Made Safety app. As we know that we are moving uh, to technology now, we also use the Made Safety app. And with the Made Safety app, both the client or the vaccinee and the health worker can report using the Med Safety Act. But with the case reporting forms that are in the facilities, they are just limited to the health workers to complete those forms. And the management of IFE, because when you are when you have um, when you have identified the IFE in the client, you have to manage the client. And then, as I said, for any serious events, they need to be investigated. And there will be the provincial and national team uh, for adverse events following immunization to analyze all the cases which are serious and the causality assessment will happen at the national level and the feedback and the, uh, the feedback is provided to the province that has reported the adverse events following immunization. So those are the levels. We start with the vaccine manufacturing. So you go to our SAPRA, you go to NDOH, World Health Organization, and the Ministerial Advisory Committees on Vaccines and Immunization. Next slide. So this is important to detect and investigate 
any event that is happening because vaccines used in the national immunization programs are considered safe and effective uh, as uh, I already alluded in the previous slides, and public trust is key to the success of vaccination programs. Hence, we need to ensure that we manage the adverse events following immunization carefully and thoroughly as health workers. And adverse events may still occur following vaccination. Most adverse events are minor, as I said, like the redness at injection site fever, and the most serious ones can result in hospitalization and death, as I said earlier on. Next slide. So this is just a summary of the role of the department to ensure the pharmacology pharmacovigilance uh, on vaccine safety. There is a causality assessment, there is a national IFE and ISC line list, and there's update, update of cases on the VG Hub. I think Busi has talked about the VG Hub, and there's monitoring of cases on the VG Hub and providing feedback to the committees and to the provinces. Next slide. So we do have the National IFE Committee, which we call National Immunization Safety Expert Committee, or in short, NISAC. NISAC will conduct the causality assessment of any serious cases. And with a causality assessment, uh, it will end up with, uh, with NISAC uh, looking whether the vaccines was related, I mean, whether the event was related to the vaccine or was coincidental or was any other factor that uh, contributed to the event. And coordinate, they coordinate communication between the IAP and the IAC, uh, the investigators, immunization staff, clinicians, patients, parents and NISAC members during the investigation process. And they advise the committee on relevant policy administration and regulatory matters with regard to the vaccines. And they'll coordinate and facilitate any research or investigation that are required for the committee to perform its functions. And they monitor the implementation of recommendations because once they um, advise on what to do, uh, they recommend, on how to how to conduct uh, like uh, clinical practices or something about the vaccines, then they have to monitor the implementation of the of those recommendations. And then we also have the provincial IFE committees. Uh, these IFE committees. Uh, they are not yet in all provinces, but majority of provinces have already established them. They are also supporting the national committee in strengthening the IF reporting in the provinces, ensure maintenance of national policy and standards, and they ensure prompt and thorough investigation of severe and serious adverse events following immunization. And they also carry periodic review of IF for trends and non-serious IAP reported and res response to the media and community concern uh, to allay fears regarding vaccine safety. And they also ensure high IAP surveillance uh, standards, ensure no serious IAPs are missed so that any serious IAPs, they have to make sure that they are being reported and all the documentation required by NISAC is submitted to the National uh, Committee. Next slide. So these are the classification uh, following the causality assessment. Once the National uh, Safety Committee receive, um, receive a, a reports and all the required documentation to make causality assessment, they will, uh, they will now uh, uh, classify the event as one of the of the fives. There's A1 about the vaccine product related reactions, or A2, which is vaccine quality defect related reaction, A3, which is immunization error related reactions, and immunization stress related reactions. So most of the adverse events following immunization that we are getting they fall under A3 and some fall under coincidental. Majority fall under coincidental. And the A3 is most common also of the adverse events 
following immunization because it's caused by inappropriate vaccine handling, prescribing, or administration. Next slide. So I talk about the coincidental events. This is the fifth uh, classification there. So as uh, with my previous slides, I have uh, alluded about the presence of any conditions before the person got vaccinated. And then thereafter, the person vaccinated unknowingly that the person has got that condition. Even some people, they even not aware that they are they are suffering from a certain condition and when they have been vaccinated, they will react, their immune, their immune system will react uh, negatively towards the vaccine and the person will have the, uh, the adverse events following immunization and they will attribute that to the vaccines of which it was not the vaccines. For instance, if you bring a child who is already having a high temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, and you cannot uh, administer a vaccine such as such a person because uh, at the end of the day, the people will think that is a vaccine of which is not a vaccine. Next slide. So when the NISAC do their causality assessment, they are using certain criteria as um, recommended or as uh, indicated by the WHO. And they are using that software to guide their assessment. There is a software that they are using and there is a causality assessment methodology manual that they are referring to. And there is a causality assessment where they are accessing to ensure that whatever they do when there is all the uh, all the required documentation are in front of them they are able to use and to make uh, to use these uh, tools so that they come up with the correct classification next slide So this is a prerequisite for the for, for, for the causality assessment. The case should be investigated and to be uh, the, the, all the forms to be completed and there should be a specific diagnosis and details and evidence on what has been done, including all the supporting documents should be submitted to the National Safety Committee. So if there's any documentation which is not being submitted by the provinces to the national uh, committee, it makes it difficult for the committee to come up with a classification of that particular event. Next slide. So these are just the factors in determining causality, eligibility of the case, the strong evidence for other causes, known causal association with the vaccines, and did the event happen within the time window, and the strong evidence against the causal association, and are there any other qualifying factors? If you refer to the previous slides, especially on the types of the uh, classification of IFEs, then you will be able to fit that the event in one of, 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 of this. Next. Next. It is very, very important for communication to avoid rumors, mis misinformation, and misconceptions. We know that in the country already have a lot of anti-vax groups, and with the rollout of COVID vaccination, they have increased in the country now. So it's very important for when you're a health worker to inform about possible common adverse events and how people should handle them. Don't just vaccinate, you need to educate the person and you need to reassure and support, but do not make false promises to the person. And also you have to to, to have a frequent communication regarding the progress of the patient and also build up and maintain relationship with everyone. This is very, very important. It's very important to build 
uh, trust, to gain back the trust if the trust was damaged uh, for the vaccination program. Next slide. So you should never ever withhold information. You have to inform you the vaccine or their families on details about the vaccine. This should be done with each and every person you is in front of you getting the vaccine. Tell the person about the name of the vaccine, what the vaccine protects against expected or potential adverse events and what to do if the vaccine experiences any event. And as health workers provide communication information, it should be understandable terms, don't use jargons, and ideally in written form if possible, and ahead of the time of vaccination. Before you vaccinate, you need to deliver this uh, messages to the patient and do not leave the vaccine or their families uninformed. It is unethical to conduct an invasive procedure without informed consent. And do not assume parents or the public will not understand information about vaccine safety. Vaccination program uh, uh, since the smallpox, um, the smallpox vaccine up to the COVID vaccines that with the introductions of these vaccines, uh, they have saved millions and millions of lives. As you can see now, even with the COVID while we we're in 2020, when COVID was killing people and early 2021, but after the introduction of the vaccines, then the death rate uh, came down. Even with other vaccines, we know that measles used to kill millions and millions of children, but with the introductions of the vaccine, then those um, it, uh, many deaths were kept from, uh, they, they were prevented uh, uh, by the vaccine. But for the vaccines to do its work, uh, to reduce the severity of infectious diseases, it should be a potent vaccine so that it can provide a long-term protection and the person can achieve the immunity with minimal number of cases in that community and should provide maximum number of antigens that confirm uh, broadest protections against infections. For instance, for children, we have a vaccines which, um, which protect against six diseases, but it's only one injection. And then that vaccine should cause no or mild adverse reactions. And the stable is stable at it should be stable at extreme storage if is a temporary is is temporary and means is heat sensitive. And it's also it should be uh, she it should be available for general use through the mass production. So we should not have stock out of vaccines. For each to do its work, we need to make sure that we have a potent vaccines maintained under the correct um, cold chain environment and being administered using the correct procedures and also assessment of patients before vaccination. And that will reduce or then minimize the number of adverse events following immunization that you are getting. So I think this is my last slide and thank you very much. Um, Hethel, are you back? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, let me share your slide. Thank you. Thank you. So just like Elizabeth did, you can just let me know when to move on to the next slide. Thanks. Okay, sure. Okay, so firstly, good evening to all. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar. My apologies uh, about earlier, I was just having some difficulties with my mic. Um, today I will be presenting on the importance of reporting adverse events to SAPRA. Um, and I'm from the Johannesburg Health District, um, and we have been doing 
a lot of ADR reporting, um, and we would like to continue to keep on doing reporting and to increase our reporting. Uh, next slide. Um, so today I just want to give you guys some of um, the examples of the side ex effects experienced at some of our healthcare facilities. Next slide. Okay, so um, one of our examples is the inalapril 10 milligrams, the biotech. Um, a patient complained about a persistent cough. Um, and although that is uh, a normal side effect that is experienced with inalapril, we still encourage that reporting should occur. So in this case, the clinician discontinued the suspected drug and replaced with amlodipine 5 milligram tablets. And that was from our Lillian Goy CHC. Um, then in a lot of cases, we had some reports with the TLD. A lot of patients have been having impaired renal function with um, the EGFR and the creatinine levels being affected. In this case, a lot of the clinicians are um, discontinuing the suspected drug and replacing it with the abacava, lamivudine, and dilutograva combination. Uh, there's been side effects with, um, with the hydrochlorothiazide as well, uh, with fluid overload. In this case, the, the, some of the clinicians are discontinuing the drug and replacing it with another antihypertensive drug, such as the furosemide. Um, we've been having a lot of reports from Eterolink CHC. They have been doing very well. Um, so they must be commended on their hard work because they have been encouraging a lot of ADR reporting and product quality reporting. Uh, next slide. So again, there's more examples. Uh, so as you guys can see, there's been uh, quite a few reports on the TLD again, with again, the impaired renal function. And in most cases, they um, stopping the drug and continuing with a back of and dolutograva. Um, we also had reactions to the combazole, um, again, impaired renal function. Uh, we've also had uh, quite a few reports on the HCTZ. Um, we've also had some reports on Atenolol, where the patient experienced some bradycardia. They discontinued the suspected drug replaced with the HCTZ. Um, again, with the Ostel inalapril, there was angiodema. They also discontinued the suspected drug. Um, so those are just some of the examples. Um, also with the COVID vaccine, uh, when especially when a lot of people were getting vaccinated, uh, we were doing a lot of follow-ups with the vaccines, um, as the presenter before spoke about um, IEFI. So in those cases, um, we would try and see what did the patient experience, how we could treat those symptoms. So one of the examples was sudden onset of hot flushes, nausea, and dizziness. Um, nothing was done because the vaccine was already given. We just had to monitor the patient. Next slide. Um, again, with the Radin and the Redac, uh, there was renal dysfunction. They discontinued the suspected drugs um, and, re and replaced with more preferable treatment. Um, Redac as well with acute kidney injury. This is dis they dis discontinued the suspected drug and replaced with Amlock and Inalapril. Um, there was again with the Myelin TDF and the Redac, renal dysfunction. They discontinue the suspected medication. Um, so I won't go through all of the, the examples uh, because we've had like a lot of reports. Um, but as you can see, Eterolink CHD has been doing very well in our district. Um, so they should be commended on their hard work. And um, they will be used as an example to try and encourage other CHDs and PhDs within our district to do reporting. Okay, next slide. Um, so what do we do as Joburg Health District to ensure patient safety with regards to the side effects experienced? Okay, next slide. So with us, what we do is we normally do um, monthly visits as part of our monitoring and evaluation of our facilities. And as part of the monitoring evaluation, we include pharmacovigilance in that. So we have um, a very nice tool that we use. Um, we, we look at different sections of pharmacy and we check how many ADR reports are they submitting every month. Um, we check if the ADR reports are completed as well. Um, we, we try and give training as well when we go on site. Um, and then once we receive all the ADR reports on a monthly basis from all our facilities, uh, we then do a summary report of all the monthly ADRs and we submit that to National Department of Health and to SEPRA. 
Um, during our ideal clinic inspections, we also check the dispensing procedures. We check whether there's correct labeling of the medications, the directions that are being given, and the counseling process. So during this process, we assess whether the pharmacists and the assistants are actually telling patients when to take the medication, for example, before meals and or after meals, whether they're explaining some of the common side effects to patients for them to be aware of, um, and also whether they, they're following up with patients to check that the patients, if they've been taking their medication, to see whether they've had any side effects with the medication so that the reporting can be done. And then during the time of COVID, we were also liaising with our traditional healers um, to explain the importance of vaccinating. Um, we explained to them the side effects of the vaccines and the impact of me uh, mixing medications with complementary alternative medications or herbal medicines. Uh, we were also checking patient prescriptions to ensure correct medications being prescribed as per the diagnosis, such as correct dosages, duration of treatment, uh, correct directions being given, and patient allergies, and also any warnings if necessary, necessary and any drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Um, so in all the cases, we normally take any interventions that are required when errors have been discovered. And then with our pharmacovigilance, um, we have regular quarterly PTC meetings with our doctors, clinicians, and pharmacists, where we discuss pharmacovigilance. Um, I usually do a pharmacovigilance presentation during that. I provide feedback on the type of reporting we've had, um, any gaps that we've identified. For example, if uh, the reports are not being filled in correctly, we discuss some of um, the adverse effects and what can be done. Um, we also encourage the clinicians to do follow-ups with patients. Um, and then we've also been providing trainings for our clinicians, our nurses, pharmacists, pharmacist assistants. And um, we've also um, done a pharmacovigilance committee within, uh, with, with our provincial department and all the different districts so that we can work together to improve our pharmacovigilance reporting. Um, and we've also now identified champions within our hospitals so that we can also encourage reporting in the hospitals. Um, so overall, we've been trying to, you know, increase pharmacovigilance because I think there's a big gap. A lot of people forget about the side effects, patients don't report. Um, and now during the campaign as well, we're going to be going out to our facilities to hand out all the posters and pamphlets. Um, we will be doing mini training sessions. Uh, we'll also be encouraging patients to reporting. Uh, we also going to be providing the manual ADR form, because currently that is the one that's the most accessible within our facilities. Um, with the electronic reporting, we found that there's been many challenges uh, because there's been issues with um, resources such as access to computers or iPads or tablets. And also um, there's been a lot of network issues because of the load shedding. So in the meantime, uh, that is what we're doing as Joburg Health District. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you to the three speakers. Um, I believe and we all believe that uh, you found this very informative all the three presentations ladies and gentlemen we now open the question and answer session i do see in the q a box there are two questions that are that remain unanswered so you may pose your questions in there or in the chat and the speakers and the rest of the panel will assist in answering the questions so ladies and gentlemen i'll start with the first question it's from johan ace and it says, does the reporting of adverse events also apply to events occurring during clinical trials? I'll hand over to the speakers to, to answer that question. Uh, thank you. This is Lucy Siwe. Um, we have a clinical trial unit. Uh, the adverse events experienced during clinical trials are sent to them, and they use the same uh, system, PG flow system that we use to uh, capture those uh, adverse events. 
but in our unit, the pharmacovigilance unit, we look at um, adverse events occurring post marketing in the post marketing se uh, setting. So for clinical trials, there's a clinical unit which they can report to. I hope uh, I answered the question. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Anne. Uh, the next question is from Antoine uh, Bole, and it says, does the scope of this presentation pertain to medical devices? I guess it's the scope of the webinar. Thank you. Yeah, I think I responded uh, on the chat, but uh, yes, I can I can say it again. Uh, the scope of this webinar, it's only on uh, medicines, of course, including vaccines. So with medical device, there is a unit where they deal with um, adverse events, or any problems uh, associated with medical devices and IBDs. So for us, we only deal with pharmacovigilance. The, the plan was for SAPRA to have vigilance as one, but for now we are only dealing with pharmacovigilance and the other units are, are separate from us which deal with uh, the adverse events uh, uh, for, for those products that they, they, that they are responsible for. For instance, also for complementary medicines, any adverse events that are experienced with the use of complementary medicines must be sent to that specific unit. So with us, it's only medicines. Thank you. Thank you, Mamsani. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A box. I'll give the uh, attendees um, perhaps another 30 seconds. And if we still do not have, uh, I'll leave the floor for uh, Mema Fora Matlala to come in and give closing remarks. Oh, well, it looks like there's one question. All right, it's not a question. So we'll wait for a few seconds and see. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the close Sorry. of the Q&A session. Um, Ethel, you may come in. Um, sorry, I just saw a question on the chat where somebody asked, um, what is Eterolink doing uh, that can be shared with other facilities? Um, so with our Eterolink CHC, what has been done is that the, the pharmacy team has gotten very much involved with the pharmacovigilance um, to try and encourage the reporting. So what they've done is they, they do regular monthly checks with the clinicians and nurses. Um, to check if there's any ADR reports coming through. They encourage the reporting to happen. And as well as the pharmacy staff themselves, um, they are doing a lot of product quality reports. So whenever they are checking their medications, they're checking the, the products to see if there's any quality defects. Um, and they're doing a lot of reporting on that um, to our pharmacovigilance team at um, the district and also to MSD so that it can reach supplier level. So we've been seeing um, a lot of improvement with the reporting ever since the pharmacy team has been involved. Thank you. Thank you, Hethel. Uh, another question in the chat, uh, it's from Nikki Hall and it says, under the heading non-serious can be disabling is written. Disabling is considered to be serious. Am I misunderstanding the comment? Um, anyone from the panel wishes to take that? Thank you. Okay, 
Can I come in, Mr. Madimija? <coughs> yes, you may, Mr. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, um, everyone on the call. So, regarding the non serious So, the non serious adverse events are the events that would normally resolve um, without any intervention within a short space of time, maybe about three days or even within 30 minutes, depending. So the disabling, whoever wrote the comment, they are actually very correct. Disabling is classified as a serious or it, it's in capacity. It's part of the seriousness criteria. So that should have been a mistake, I would think, if it was put under the, the non serious And our, our sincere apologies for that oversight. non serious are not disabling, um, only the serious. We regard them to be disabling or incapacitating, but we must also remember that um, the incapacity or the disabling, sometimes it can be temporary, it doesn't have to be um, continuous. Thank you. Okay, Mema said this also there. Maybe she will like to clarify that part. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the question. Uh, I will just recheck the slides because I uh, it is as serious as uh, uh, Flora is saying. It's supposed to be under the serious column. The, yes, I, I will just recheck the slides and then correct them and say the corrected slides. If it is there under the non-serious, it was by, by, by mistake. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mama Seti. Um, we'll now open the floor for Mema Fora Matlala to give us the closing remarks. Mema Matlala, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madi Major. Um, colleagues from far and near, um, from us as Sabra, we would like to firstly appreciate your time. Um, this is family time, actually, where you're supposed to be. Uh, spending time with your kids and your husbands and wives. However, you have made this possible. Without your presence, we would not have been able to have this webinar. So we would like to really appreciate um, your effort to make it to the webinar. And um, in the spirit of commemorating the Med Safety Week, we would like to encourage that as you continue with your daily activities throughout the week at your respective um, environments, we would like you to promote the Med Safety Week as it speaks to one of the tools that we use in terms of reporting, as Pussy has alluded in her presentation, the Med Safety app, um, to say let's continue to promote this pharmacovigilance. Um, we are just touching the surface, but I believe that. If we do this together, we can definitely go a long way in terms of addressing the underreporting of adverse events that we are aware of, not only in our country, but worldwide. So it's only through webinars like this and your attendance in webinars like this that we can continue to improve on the knowledge of pharmacovigilance and as well impart the knowledge to our colleagues that were not able to make it, to our patients so that we can continue to ensure the safety of our medicine um, while in turn we are ensuring the public safety. So um, in short, I would like to say thank you, number one, and then number two, um, hashtag med safety week, hashtag, uh, hashtag patient safety, hashtag reporting. So let's continue to promote pharmacovigilance. Thank you, Mr. Madimija, and thank you everyone who managed to make it.